to do is turn the live stream on. Okay, so at this moment, we are, we are now actually live. And it's almost time to start the clock. There we go, it is time, there. So uh, what happens now is that the announcement goes out to maybe about 12,000 uh, of our subscribers. So people will start logging in. So now they know that the actual program will start in less than 10 minutes. I see. And uh, I presume on your screen, you're looking at uh, the countdown clock and then you see the two tiny little windows where each of us appear. Right, that's what I'm seeing. And the um, nice Tao symbol uh -huh. in color. In color. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <clears throat> I designed that. Did you design that? I was just going to ask. No kidding. Yeah. I like that. I did, well yeah. Uh, well done. Yeah, it's fun. <clears throat> so um, what, what kind of uh, questions are we dealing with here? It's just going to well, be spontaneous, the, and that's fine with me. Yeah, it will be. The audience members are on YouTube. Not on Zoom. So everything that we say on Zoom gets piped over to YouTube. And then there's a chat window. They post their questions in the chat window. Mm -hmm. I have some volunteers who are going to select the best of those questions Great. and then send them over to me. Okay. But, but we could start with a, an introductory conversation. Sure. Okay. And just to sort of maybe... Yeah, talk about some of the things that are on your mind recently. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to um, Edward uh, before you logged in about scheduling a date to do an interview on Tom Thomas Aquinas. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. I'm up so that. Hopefully, maybe in about two weeks. Wonderful. And, and hopefully we can do one after that on Hildegard and another one on uh, Julian of Norwich. Mm. Or uh, did they say Norwich? That's it, Norwich. Yeah, the W is silent. I yeah. have learned. I, I, it's taking me a while to figure that out. But. Right, yeah. I don't know. Why do they put the W in if they want it silent? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> there's nothing logical about language after all. Yeah. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be cool. I'd like that. Yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. I have um, your big book right here. On, uh, oh, sure, joy. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. So I've been I've been going through it in preparation for an interview on Aquinas. It's oh. a wonderful book. Oh well, thank you. You know, my more my most recent book. Is is like a brief version of that. Well, and but it's updated. Of course, that, that is all him. But do you know? Do you have this one? Because this is easier to deal with. Um, well, the Dow of a Dow of Thomas Aquinas, which is nice with your Dow figure. Yeah, I do Here's have wisdom for hard. Yeah, you do have that. Okay, uh -huh, I have. This one. draws on the sheer joy, of course. But it's it's um, it, that carries it on a little more. So let's see, Dennis is calling me. Let me see what he's calling about. Hello. Hi. Oh, our conversation is live, Jeffrey. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, I know that. People can hear everything we're saying. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, it's not as if we're talking naughty or anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> But that's interesting. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a good reminder. I have occasionally had guests who who wanted to gossip about oh. some person, and and that went out live, and I was unhappy about that. <laughs> it, it it is true that uh, the viewers who are tuning in, and there are probably quite a few of them already. Uh, in fact, over 70 people right now. 
Uh -huh. uh, they can hear everything we're saying and they see okay. it in these tiny little windows. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, uh, we're talking about Thomas Aquinas, so that's not exactly gossip. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's see. Uh, the uh, moderators are telling me, however, that, who are tuning in, and there are yeah. probably quite a few of them are there. There was a, a, an extra window mm. open, so there was an echo. I hope I've gotten rid of the echo. I hope so too. I don't, I don't hear an echo. It sounds real clear to me. Yeah. Well, you're not on the YouTube channel. Uh, that, that, that's why. But anyhow, I think I've corrected the problem and I'm pretty sure the moderators will let me know if I haven't. Uh -huh. But I, I'm very interested in, you know, being able to have this conversation uh, with you about these great mystics of the past. Mm. Yeah, I think we need them now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when times get tough, you know, you, you need some um, deeper wisdom than the, what can I say, the everyday culture wants to offer us you know yeah so um yeah it's been a, a real blessing for me to be able to spend a lifetime studying these these mystics of the past and bringing them forward like like julian who mm -hmm. lived you know i really got into her during the pandemic because she lived through the worst pandemic ever the bubonic plague mm -hmm. where one out of two people died so it was amazing going back to her in the context of our going through a pandemic and, and all that and realizing how, what can I say, how optimistic she was in spite of all the suffering around her. And, uh, and of course, without having the science we have, no promise of vaccines or even no awareness of where the, the killing was coming from. So uh, she's an amazing figure mm -hmm. and so appropriate for a time of pandemic so that's just one example of the relevancy of these mm -hmm. these uh heart specialists called mystics <laughs> well i didn't appreciate until i started reading your book that uh aquinas was driven to to becoming mute from all of the uh, conflicts that he was <clears throat> embroiled in yeah. And some people say he might have had a stroke there at the end of his life. Um, in fact, a number of knowledgeable people tell me that, that his, his symptoms sound a lot like a stroke. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it can be both and, both a, a breakdown and a stroke and a mystical experience all at once. He, he himself just said, uh, everything I've written is straw compared to what I've experienced in this mystical experience everything you've written a straw and then he never spoke or wrote again and uh so it is a powerful story and a powerful lesson really because mm -hmm. he was a giant of our mind and uh, he produced i mean he died at 49 and he produced this incredible quantity this volume mm -hmm. of work but of course it's a quality that is important but um uh, i mean he was a genius he had a photographic memory he would dictate to four secretaries at a time and uh, uh, everything he read, he remembered, <laughs> memorized, like the Bible mm -hmm. or other theologians. So he was, and of course, Aristotle, yeah. the he was bringing into the West. Uh, it, no, he was just a, a freak. He was a giant. He was an Einstein or a Hildegard in his day. I would imagine that today he's thought of as really one of the foremost uh, authorities on uh, Catholic doctrine. Well, yes, but he he wasn't as interested in doctrine as some <laughs> as so much as say uh, ecclesial police are. Uh, <laughs> he was he was much more interested in the expansive um, unfolding of the universe. He says, for example, you know, the most excellent thing in the universe is not the human. He says, 
The most excellent thing in the universe is the universe itself. And we're all here to serve the universe. All the beings are, you know. Mm -hmm. So that just takes you right out of the modern consciousness, which is so human-centered and has resulted, of course, in our climate change extinction crisis today. But um, like most pre-moderns, yeah, he wanted to think about the whole first mm -hmm. and, and post-moderns, you know, David Bohm says, I'm a postmodern scientist who begins with the whole. Well, that's how Aquinas began too and uh, made all the difference. Well, now we're live and I've stopped the countdown clock. So I'd like to welcome everybody. I am here with Matthew Fox, the you know, founder of the University of Creation, Spirituality, and the author of numerous books on uh, various aspects of spirituality and mysticism. Uh, Matthew, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you. I'm, I'm so delighted that we've reconnected after my original interview with you over 30 years ago. Over 30 years ago. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. And it's good to see you still kicking and operating so fruitfully after all these years. That we're both pretty much doing the, the same things today that we were doing back then, which I think is a good sign. <laughs> I think so. We love our work, I guess. That, that's uh, certainly uh, the case for me. And I I uh, can't imagine that it would be otherwise for you, considering uh, how joyful uh, your approach to spirituality is. <laughs> well, you know what the Tao Te Ching says, in work, do what you enjoy. So um, it is a joy to be able to bring ideas forward that, that have touched oneself as fruitful and beautiful and truthful. So, yeah, it's a great vocation you and I are in. <clears throat> Well, let, let me begin by asking you about the status of the creation spirituality movement. Uh, I'm under the impression, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the, the University of Creation Spirituality, which was very active at the time I did the original interview with you, does it still exist? No, it doesn't exist anymore as a university, but there is a, uh, a group uh, called Creation Spirituality Communities, which is um, was organized by graduates of our school, and it's going very strong, and it has a certificate program now in Creation Spirituality. So it's putting on courses online, um, and in fact, I'm going to be teaching in that school. I don't know, sometime later in this year, and um, but they're they're doing a real good job. They're doing courses on the mystics and courses on the overview of Christ spirituality and so forth. And um, uh, they're going to do a course on evil because I wrote a big book on evil. They're going to be operating from and I just They just did a course on work and I wrote a book on reinvention of work and they invited me to drop in on one of their classes, which I did. So um, I'm real glad they're doing that. And I think, I don't know, rather than get, getting all wrapped up in the niceties of, um, of uh, academia, and uh, uh, degrees and all that, that time is running out for our species. So I think they sense that it's better to educate as many possible in as uh, quick a time as possible, rather than uh, you know, try to go through all the hoops, and the bureaucracies of uh, accreditation and all that. So it's a, it's a mo more modest um, goal of being a certificate program rather than a degree program. I remember the original University of Creation Spirituality. You had a wide variety of teachers from many different cultural approaches. You had uh, Starhawk, who, who was a witch. I think that particularly irritated the church authorities, but also people like Louisa Tish, who, who was a high priestess of the uh, African uh, Yoruba tradition. That's true. No, we had a variety of teachers and we had physicists and cosmologists and a lot of artists teaching art as meditation. So we had clay as meditation, like MC Richards, a potter, a very renowned potter. She taught that course as well as a course on, on uh, poetry. And, um, and of course we had biblical scholars and we had um, uh, indigenous teachers 
always. And uh, one Lakota man, he, um, he would build sweat lodges on campus. And um, this disturbed the Vatican a little bit, as, as well as Starhawk. I told Starhawk for the, every time that the Vatican wrote my provincial complaining about me, they, they would mention at the bottom of the letter, and he has a witch on his faculty. So I told Starhawk that. And she said to me, she said, I don't know why they're afraid of us. We didn't burn any of them at the stake, she said. <laughs> it seems to a pretty factually accurate statement. But um, the Wicca tradition, and, and Starhawk herself was raised an Orthodox Jew. And of course, what she really is, is a prophet. Because early in, the, in her career in the 60s, she discovered the feminist movement. And she realized that uh, there was wisdom from women that was not being brought forward enough to her satisfaction in her uh, synagogue. So she uh, took that step to, to um, investigate the the wicked tradition. But yeah, I think this is just normal for today that obviously we're living in a world that includes uh, uh, feminism and Wicca and science and uh, Taoism and, and Hinduism. We had a, a teacher who taught our yoga, sound yoga, and um, he was from India. And um, and he was very valuable too. So yeah, we were blessed with psychologists, you know, Jungian psychologists, and we taught Otto Rank as well. And um, it was very thrilling, really. And I was alive just being around all these people. And of course, <laughs> our faculty meetings were pretty lively because everyone came from this different angle. And it was beautiful and wonderful. So we're, there were Judas and Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and um, Sufis. And as you say, uh, feminist and Wicca and indigenous. And I think that's the way the world is. So why wouldn't we want to call on a, a group wisdom at this critical time? You know, I call that deep ecumenism. Well, the ecumenical movement normally excludes, I think, so many of these groups that are thought of as fringe. That is true. That is true. For example, Hans Kuhn was a very renowned Catholic theologian who just died recently, he's from Switzerland. But uh, he wrote a book on world religions and he left out indigenous religions and it just freaked me out. But then I said, you know, I calmed myself down and said, well, he's from Europe, you know, the Europeans did away with all their indigenous. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I've had exposure to indigenous wisdom here. I've been blessed by uh, having so many indigenous teachers in my life. But, um, but I really was freaked out by that that a, a great Catholic theologian would write a book on world religions and leave out the first religions. I mean, please. So I was scandalized by that actually. And he and I went to the same university. We both graduated from the Institut Catholique in Paris. So that was even more reason for me to be upset. <laughs> well, uh, here's a comment one of our viewers has already posted. Liza Field says, I love Matthew Fox. He changed my whole parish, my family, and my life. All right. Well, thank you. I hope we change it for the good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's change and there's change. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a lot of... We did that. Does she want to elaborate on how that happened? Well, uh, yes, let's invite her to elaborate if, if she would like to. That's all I have. Uh, uh, because the viewers are posting in the chat and uh, may, she'll probably post something again. Here's a question from uh, someone whose internet name or YouTube name is Ungato, who asks, what do you think of Emerson in the Unitarian Church? Well, yes, um, I have great respect for the um, transcendental movement and, of course, Emerson and... Um, and Walt Whitman and uh, that whole, is creation centered. It really is. And um, uh, of course the UU church today and um, its commitment, especially to social justice and it's, and science, which includes of course science. And um, that intellectual side is very important to faith. And you realize it is when, when you listen to some of these fundamentalist types, the ones who are making all the money uh, by preaching um, what they preach, uh, uh, what's lacking there in terms of an intellectual life. 
And so I respect that very much. And I know I, I had some good friends in the Boston area because I spent uh, most of a year there many years ago, but we were still friends. And many of them have left, they were Roman Catholic, many were the Irish or Italian and Roman Catholic, but many of them have left Catholicism and joined the U church, UU church because they found there the social justice values that they had learned after the Second Vatican Council and from liberation theology. But the two popes that followed, uh, JP II and Pope Benedict, were anti-liberation theology, and they couldn't stomach that. That was contrary to their conscience. So they left and joined the UU, where you're, you're um, able to talk about these important things and act on them, and where you're not tied down by dogma. So um, it's interesting to me. I think a lot of uh, the UU church has been a refuge an oasis for a lot of um, eager Roman Catholic uh, activists. And uh, so I think that's been an unusual role that the UU church has played. Or to put it another way, they should be very grateful to two popes of the late 20th century who, who by their um, resistance to justice movements, uh, chased a lot of Roman Catholics into the UU church. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, Emerson and all, um, they were about finding, and of course Thoreau, about finding spirit in nature, about finding divine in nature, and of course about then carrying on the struggles, such as Thoreau is a fine example, of um, standing up for justice, whether it be eco-justice, social justice, and so forth. I have heard, since, since you mentioned liberation theology, I've heard one critic say that the reason liberation theology was frowned upon is, is because, uh, at least according to this person, uh, it denied God. I, I'm surprised to hear that, but I think they thought that there was something atheistic about it. Well, they don't deny the God of justice. And Oscar Romero, of course, was one of the leaders in, in uh, was in Salvador and was martyred, literally, and they canonized him a saint a few years ago. So, um, and of course, I knew personally Bishop Casadaliga, who was a bishop in the Amazon, and he was a saint. And his, um, his many of his priests and, and nuns and lay people were tortured by the, uh, the military of Brazil and uh, killed. And he had lots of stories tell me about that. And um, I spent a week with him and his people in the Amazon. It was very, one of the most powerful weeks of my life. And he was a poet and a real mystic himself, as well as being a very strong but gentle uh, leader. And then Cardinal Arns in Brazil, who supported Leonardo Boff, the liberation theologian in Brazil, the Franciscan. He was very strong and he, and he was fluent and seven languages. I spent an hour alone with him and learned a lot about the papacy of the time, Pope John Paul II, uh, that he was very frank about to me. And um, so he was a saint too. So, I mean, in fact, the liberation theology movement, the base community movement, uh, produced a lot of heroic martyrs. And I'll tell you one story. When I was there that week in the Amazon, um, there was a gathering of the church workers 200 came, it was a retreat for a week. And um, many of them were defending the rainforest and defending the indigenous people in the rainforest and so forth. Um, and they had a, a mass one night, a simple mass in a gymnasium. And at the end, everyone was asked to go up and light a candle and name three people they knew personally who had been tortured and martyred, tortured and killed for defending the rainforest and the rainforest Indians. And everyone there went up and named three people. And one person came up to the afternoon and said, the hard part was limiting it to three. I know at least 10 off the top of my head. And I have goosebumps just saying this because these people were in jeans and t-shirts. They were just ordinary human beings, but it showed the courage that we all have within us if it's invited forward for a good cause. And of course that good cause was, you know, justice, and eco-justice and the base communities represented the future of, of the church. And uh, they still do, 
but uh, sad to say, two popes, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, uh, dismantled as hard as they could liberation theology and base communities and substituted these heroic saintly leaders with Opus Dei, which is a right-wing fascist movement in the Catholic Church. So if you check a lot of the bishops and cardinals uh, since that time in South America, um, they were Opus Dei. Now, um, one very knowledgeable priest told me when they canonized John Paul II, he said to me, that man is responsible, and he was very knowledgeable of Latin American church. He said that man was responsible for at least 10,000 murders in South America. By killing liberation theology and based communities, they got at least 10,000 people murdered by the dictators of South America, such as uh, uh, Pinochet and others. So it's not a pretty story, but these stories should be told. Uh, more people have died in my lifetime in South America as martyrs than ever died in Rome under the, the um, empire um, uh, in, the in, in the catacombs. So this should be acknowledged. <clears throat> that, that sounds very serious. In, in other words, you think those lives might have been spared if, if the Pope had, instead of suppressing liberation theology, had uh, given it his support. Of course. And I've written up this up in my book called The Pope's War, The Pope's War, where I document all this, how the CIA under Reagan Three months after Reagan was inaugurated, there was a gathering in Santa Fe of all the national security uh, groups, heads, CIA and so forth. And there was one question that they were discussing in this seminar, I think it went on for 10 days. How can we kill liberation theology in South America? And the answer was, we can't kill it, but we can divide the church. So what did they do? They went after Pope John Paul II with money lots of money. The head of the CIA at the time was a very right-wing Catholic, probably Opus Dei, Jim Casey, and he personally made 29 trips to Rome with satchels full of cash, gave to the Pope, the Pope gave to Solidarity in Poland, and in exchange, the Vatican went after liberation theology in South America, and it did split the church. So that's a fact, and it's documented, and it's documented in my book. And uh, that those realities. And here, you know, we still have the leftover of that, um, that linkage, that marriage with right-wing Catholicism and right-wing Americanism in the Supreme Court today. Why are uh, five, all five of these Supreme Court judges who are poised to kill uh, Roe Wade, why are they all conservative Catholics? And far right wing, very far right wing Catholic. It's the same thing because the, there was this link, conscious link, beginning with Reagan to get uh, these far right wing Catholics uh, into governmental positions of power and uh, decision making. So, you know, people have to wake up to this. And, um, uh, you know, we, we're paying a tremendous price. I mean, every, the women are paying, are paying a tremendous price and will pay a tremendous price, but not just women. Our whole society is going to be torn apart because two thirds of America today say they want Roe to stay. It's not a perfect law, but it's better than having politicians telling you what to do with your body than creepy politicians. Two of these judges, who are, in my opinion, have turned politician, two of them are under the spotlight for having been accused for sexual misconduct. And, and it's never been investigated and they're untouchable it seems. But the point is that it, it's a terrible choice between abortion and no abortion, but it's even a worse choice between um, uh, abortion or having some creepy politician or creepy judge tell you what to do with your body. Come on, we're all adult enough to know, find our conscience and, and make decisions about our bodies and women, especially. This is one more case. I think it's so important that in that leak that was made, the, <laughs> it's, it's laughable, but it's unbelievable that the Alito 
goes to a 17th century lawmaker who burned witches at the stake. He cites them in this document. I presume whatever they decide, they might take that little footnote out. It's more than a footnote, but they might take the whole paragraph out just not to embarrass them forever. But if I were Alito, I would resign immediately being so embarrassed that he's calling on a 17th century witch burner to make a decision in 2022 about women's bodies. What is this? How crazy has the unsupreme court become? Don't get me going on this. You better get another one. <laughs> You've already got me going. But I mean, this is real. This is about justice. This is about misogyny. This is about killing women. There are many occasions when women have to have an abortion or they will die. And religion has always made room for this. But in these new bills coming out of Oklahoma and Texas and every place, all the Confederate states, these new bills are out to kill women, period. That's what's going to happen. And there will be bedlam in this country. And one dimension of it will be that people will never again believe in what the Supreme Court has to say. It is to quote, the newest court member, a political hacks have been taken over in the Supreme Court. They have taken over the Supreme Court. It's a scandal. And it could be the death of America. Well, it's very clear that you have a strong view on it. And uh, to be honest, I concur. Uh, with you. I want to go back, though, to Liza Field, the woman who said that you changed her life, her whole parish, and her family, because she's posted again, and she says, because of creation theology, which she then says in parentheses, reality, <laughs> I plant trees, restore wildlife, habitat, and soil, and save land. It's a horrible time on earth, ecologically and politically. Amen. Well, thank you to Lisa. I'm glad that I've, my work has encouraged her. That's a, a great grace. And I'm wonderful, wonderfully glad that she's out doing that. Good stuff. Spread it. Get others. Well, here, and uh, I've got another note from uh, one of our moderators who says that the uh, people viewing are very happy that you're addressing the question of abortion. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you. So here's a, to change the uh, topic somewhat. Monica Mush uh, asks, and she's quoting now from the Bible, Matthew and Luke, who write about Jesus driving demons into pigs. Could it be said that Jesus used shamanic healing techniques? Mm. Yes, um, there are many ways in which Jesus is shamanic. In fact, I did a, um, a weekend workshop on shamanism and Buddhism and shamanism and Christianity with Isa Garucci, who is a Buddhist who teaches uh, courses, offers certificates on shamanism. So that's available if you want to go to my webpage, uh, matthewfox.org, because it was a wonderful exchange and it got me working more on this whole subject of Christianity and shamanism, because um, there's no question there's a lot of shamanism in the Jesus story. Um, that's one example, but also the um, example in uh, Mark's gospel begins with his baptism. And right after he was baptized, what did he do? He went into the desert where we're told he wrestled with, um, with uh, angels and, and uh, amidst the wild animals. And we also know that uh, when Jesus, as a teenager, apprenticed with John the Baptist, uh, who lived in the desert, that desert of Judea at the time was, um, had lions in it. So Jesus came of age as a teenager, learning to live with lions. I think that's pretty interesting. And of course, his mentor, whom he was studying under, if you will, uh, got his head chopped off at the end by the empire. Literally, he got beheaded. So, I mean, those two things, you know, living with lions in a desert and having your mentor be beheaded by the emperor's uh, agent in, in your occupied land needs to say those are pretty big 
um, impressions that were left on, on this young man who we know as, as Jesus or Rabbi Jesus. So um, uh, there are so many examples, really, when you, when you ask that question, when you put on those glasses about shamanism that um, uh, Jesus is alluding to. And here's one more example, though there are many. The story of his crucifixion and then Easter, but what went in between, Holy Saturday, the story tells us that he visited the dead. He went to the underworld. Well, that is so shamanistic. And he, he released people from the underworld. Um, that too is a very shamanistic story. So uh, there are many examples of that in, in the gospels and far more than, than we've asked about before because we've not had shamanism on our mind because what we had on our mind, I'm sorry to say, and I shouldn't be laughing about it, is invading uh, indigenous cultures and doing away with as many shamans as we could. Uh, that's been the, the thrust of European Christianity since the 16th century, I'm sorry to say. And a lot of it was um, given a green light by the um, papal documents of the 15th century that we know as the Discovery Doctrine. Uh, three papal bulls uh, promulgated by two popes allowed Christian explorers, if you will, to go to other lands such as Africa to steal slaves or any other treasures they had and to the Americas and then to the islands of the Pacific because they were not, quote, Christian, part of the Christian empire. It's a horrible moment in Christian history. I urge Pope Francis, if any of you have contacts with him, tell him this, he should burn those three documents in St. Peter's Square with television flowing, watching. So it goes around the world because those documents are, are the basis of so much colonialism and um, indigenous genocide in the world. Now, he doesn't have to do it literally. He might want to keep them, put them under glass in a museum, but to take copies of them and burn them publicly in St. Peter's, that would do a lot of good for healing for the indigenous people. They've been putting up with this stuff for long enough. And um, I think that is a sacramental moment that could provide a lot of healing between indigenous people and, and others, and especially Christians. And of course, the stories are coming out now, finally, about the schools, church-run schools and government-run schools that literally stole children from their families, from their communities, took them often hundreds of miles away to brainwash them, cut their hair and their language and therefore their culture and all the rest. I mean, these sins are just coming to the fore and uh, they have created so much pain, so much uh, suffering and trauma, generation after generation among indigenous people. And this has to be, um, you know, uh, apologized for, but acted on. Very powerful prophetic words. Here is a, a comment from a YouTube person who calls themselves Virtual Selfie. And they would like to know if you have any thoughts regarding uh, what is called the sixth extinction event. Well, of course, that's what we're living through, isn't it? Um, that uh, we're living through the greatest extinction event since the dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago. And of course that was caused by a comet. But um, this cause of what we're living through is mostly caused by humans, homo sapiens. And I like to remind people, you know, that today we're discovering, we knew about Neanderthal, the Neanderthal people and the Denizen people, but now we're discovering in Southeast Asia, I think we have named 14 other cousins of ours, uh, hominids like us that are no longer in existence, just like Neanderthal are present only in our, our genes. But the point is that we're the last one standing. And there have been 14 to 16 that we've named, but we're gonna discover more of our cousins. But they're all out of business, that's the point. And so to be told by the United Nations just again two weeks ago 
that we have seven years left as a species to change our ways, we really should wake up. We are headed the way of all the other hominids who are extinct now because uh, there are fallacies, failures in our way of seeing the world. And uh, the way I would put it is that number one, we're allowing our reptilian brains to dominate. Whereas all the great spiritual leaders, whether you're talking Buddha or Lao Tzu or Black Elk or Jesus or Muhammad or Isaiah, all these great leaders have tried to call us to compassion, our powers of compassion, which is the mammal brain, not the reptilian brain. We have to learn to calm the reptilian brain, to allow that mammal brain to assert itself. And that is a compassionate brain. And, um, and that is adulthood, that spiritual adulthood. We're stuck in this adolescence of the reptilian brain. I win, you lose the testosterone that feeds patriarchy. You can see it in, in, with Putin today, but you can see it everywhere in so much history. So we humans have to change. And there are two ways to calm the reptilian brain that I can recommend. One is meditation. That does it because reptiles are, they like solitude. And that's what meditation is, is getting into solitude. But the second is sports. I think sports are a genius way that humanity has always, I don't know one culture that doesn't have sports, always found a way to play with the reptilian brain. So take basketball. We're living through the NBA finals here or whatever it is. You've got a parameter. You've got a time clock. You've got referees. You've got rules. Okay, within all that, then you let five guys go out against five guys and do whatever they want to each other within those rules. That's playing with the reptilian brain. And of course, the crowd, the home crowd goes crazy when they win and they go sad when they lose. Okay, it's all over in 24 hours. That, but that's genius. That's genius. That shows some of the genius of our species that we can play with our enemies because it is an enemy. If, if the reptilian brain runs away with us, it's, it's going to kill us all. So that's just an example of what we can be doing in this context. And um, that's how you turn back the sixth um, uh, extinction. Uh, that you, we got to work on ourselves, our inner work. And as uh, one doctor said, um, we don't need more um, gadgets. Here, here this is uh, Dr. Larry, Larry Dossie. He's commenting my book on Meister Eckhart, one of the greatest mystics of the West. He says, whether our species has a future on earth does not depend on the development of more gee whiz technologies, but on whether we're willing to move into the psycho spiritual dimension proclaimed by Meister Eckhart and elucidated by Matthew Fox. In other words, we got to work on ourselves, this inner work, because otherwise we're just going to be making more nuclear bombs. So the kind of war in Ukraine can be even more successful. And I use that word in quotation marks. I mean, we're so ready to destroy everything. That's the extinction. That's the sixth extinction that we're talking about. We humans are that asteroid that destroyed all the dinosaurs. I mean, we're going to destroy all the elephants, all the rainforests, all the whales, all the oceans and rivers and so And yeah, all the humans too. That's the path we're on. So what's it going to take to get us to wake up? And I'm not fooling. I'm not about just individuals. I'm talking about corporations. How much they've invested in denial. How much has Exxon invested in denial? Buying politicians. Yes, buying politicians who in turn make Supreme Court judges to deny that ecology is the number one moral issue of our time. And, you know, we have to wake up and get up and get smart and get strong and have that mystical love of life on the one hand, but the prophetic warrior energy to stand up to this, these lies that are everywhere. And Fox News and Rupert Murdoch, that man gets rich on every lie that comes out of politicians' mouths. And he gets to be a billionaire. And he's an immigrant. And yet his whole Republican Party that he's serving is, a, they tell us, against immigration. But he's a, an immigrant making billions in America from Fox News. Fox News, a hate television thing. And this Carson Tucker, who's making millions of dollars for him. And he's, he literally instructed 
this 18 year old boy who went out to kill black people and got it done. This white supremacy is being sold. Well, it's being given away, being paid. However, the people doing it, like Tucker Carlson, is that his name, uh, is, um, is getting rich. I, how, how immoral is that? What kind of example is that to young people, to have an adult getting millions and millions and millions of dollars by preaching racism and racial superiority? And it reaches minds that are young and vulnerable and maybe sick already. They're not sick already. They will be sick. And of course, they can go out and buy ARK 15s any place, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how much time do we have left to tell the truth about greed, about greed, and about murder and hatred in, in the human psyche that is flourishing at this time? I didn't know it was going to get so angry <laughs> today, but, but yeah, but he asked the question about the extinction, and, I, and that's that's my answer. We're we're into it. We're really well along in this extinction thing. We got seven years left, folks, to to put truth forward and uh, put some leashes on this reptilian brain-driven capitalist media that makes money on killing and lies and lies and killing. And Very powerful is melting. words, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, here's a question. I think it's a related question from Stephanie Ramirez, who asked, do you perceive a war on spirituality being perpetrated by many futurist transhumanists? Futurist transhumans. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not real sure what that means. What is a futurist transhuman? I, I'm pretty sure it's uh, people who feel that uh, the human race is, is moving towards a kind of fusion with technology. That oh, I see. We'll okay. all upload our consciousness into computers at some point and, and, and we'll become cyborgs or something along those lines. Uh, okay. That the human being is really a machine. So we ought to mm -hmm. perfect our machine-like qualities. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a, all at home with that. I think what makes humans special is our hearts, our capacity for love and compassion and forgiveness on the one hand, and our minds, our intelligence, our creativity, the fact that we're, we've sent out this latest gift in the universe, the web telescope, any day now, the web telescope is gonna be sending pictures back to our living rooms in our computers of the um, original light of the universe. Now, light, you know, when usually, of course, understandably, when we think of the word light, we think of the sunlight. Uh, but the sun is only 5 billion years old. Uh, the universe's light is 13.8 billion years old. It, it was the beginning of the universe. And it birthed, it was an integral part of birthing all this beauty and all this wonder and all this darkness and all this light. So um, this is a tremendous moment to, re to remind ourselves of our capacity as human beings to work with our um, technology, the things we give birth to, with our science and the rest. But um, it, it doesn't answer the questions of morality as such. It doesn't, and it doesn't answer the questions of gratitude of what spirituality is and of wisdom as a sink from just knowledge. So if you think human intelligence stops with knowledge, then I think you can believe that um, cyber humans are the future. But if you believe that human intelligence is bigger than knowledge, that it includes wisdom, and wisdom is about joy, and wisdom is about justice, and wisdom is about compassion, and wisdom is about fun and eros and play and, and uh, laughter. Uh, I think the human is much richer than, than you can fit into a machine. 
and um, there are choices we make. And uh, yeah, there's a danger that we'll create creatures. I mean, already we've done it. This isn't the future. I think the creation of Fox News is a, is a thing. It's a, a machine. It's definitely a machine that is, is working um, against us and against the future of the earth. So it's already happened. So um, obviously everything we do, we have to critique and uh, in light of justice and in light of uh, uh, common, the common good. And um, so I think, yeah, we're dealing with these, we should be dealing with these issues today, but the future, yeah, will hold more potential uh, destruction or more potential uh, beauty and joy, depending on what, what path we choose. And I'm hoping, for example, the Webb telescope will bring more beauty and joy and awe and above all gratitude that humans will realize it's been a 13.8 billion year journey. We're so come so late, but everything be, that preceded us was necessary for us to be here, for this earth to work, etc. So all that should fill us with gratitude. None of us made ourselves. It's taken all this time. And so to be able to bring that original energy and light into our, our purview at this time, this is a great moment. And maybe it could wake us up uh, from our folly, from our, our desire for war and, and I win, you lose, which is a reptilian brain consciousness. I have a question here from someone uh, named Jack Patrick, and he's asking about, uh, he'd like to hear you talk about the story of the co-writing process with Rupert Sheldrake. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, it's been one of the pleasures of my life to write, to get to know Rupert and to be friends with him and, and to write two books with him. We do one book called The Physics of Angels. So we wrote about angels and I'm not sure that uh, any modern scientist has had the courage to write about angels with a theologian. Um, in that book, he makes the point that uh, Wallace was a scientist and friend of, of Darwin, who together with him developed the theory of evolution. And together they presented it uh, back to back at a science conference in London. And, but they did ultimately have a split, a divorce. And that was over the topic of angels that uh, Darwin was saying is all by chance and, and survival of the fittest. And Wallace said, no. No, there are too many amazing things that have happened, like the invention of the eye, for example, that could not have been just happened by, there's not enough time for it to happen by chance and so forth. Therefore, there must have been an intelligent agents guiding the process. And the name for intelligent agents is angels. So this story should be in every high school biology class that there was this clash at the beginning of the theory of evolution around whether it's really purposeless or, or all, um, uh, the survivor of the fittest, or whether there were guiding intelligences. But um, so I learned a lot from Rupert. And we, we, what we did at first, we shared some lectures together. We lectured together in London we, uh, several times, and we lectured together um, at some retreat conferences. And then, um, and we recorded these uh, lectures, and then uh, we edited them. And then we also had some sessions alone in his home that we recorded, conversations that we recorded. And that was our process. Um, and of course, we approved on a methodology, like for the angel book, we, we agreed on three major theologians through the centuries who've written about angels. Hildegard of Vigan, 12th century, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, and Dennis Seriapagat, 6th century. And so we'd take some of their works and then we'd take a paragraph and we'd each comment on it. He from a scientific point of view, me from a, a theological point of view. So that's how we did the angel book. And, but the, the other book, A Natural Grace too, we did, uh, we recorded um, various lectures and then edited down and so forth and went back and forth. 
But it was a, a fine process and I felt a very dignified one where each of us respected the other's domain, if you will. And it was beautiful to see the overlap. Here, here's one more example from the angel conversations. When, um, when Rupert read Thomas Aquinas on angels, it blew his mind. He said, if you substitute the word quantum for angel in the very questions Aquinas is asking, as well as his answers, this is today's quantum physics, he said. And this just blows my mind that a 13th century genius was asking quantum questions, but, but using the word angel, because an angel is a, um, a light being. And, and one of the questions was, the, is light being uh, moving at the speed of light, which obviously is the 20th, 20th century of uh, Einsteinian question too. So um, it was a beautiful experience. And, um, uh, but I appreciate Rupert so much. He's so good at, I'm a, not, I'm a lay person when it comes to science. I, I try to read about it, but I, I don't pretend any expertise. But he speaks to lay people, even though he's speaking from a very developed uh, scientific uh, sophistication. Uh, at the same time, he also reads philosophy and he reads theology. And um, he has a practice. He is a practicing Anglican, a practicing Christian. He and his wife are. But uh, his story is interesting, too, that as a, as a boy, he when confirmation came along in the school he was in, he was the only guy in his class who refused to take it because he had learned by that time when he was 14 or so that you either were a Christian or an atheist or a scientist, I mean, either a Christian or a scientist. And being scientist meant you had to be an atheist. So he chose to be a scientist and an atheist. And he was that from the age of 14 till in his 20s, when after getting his doctorate at Cambridge, he went to India. And in India, he was taken by yoga and by the... the many spiritual traditions that were alive and well there. And finally, one yoga teacher told him, hey, why don't you visit your, your Christian monk down in the south of India, Father B. Griffiths, he's from England. He's one of your people and uh, check him out. So Rupert did that, he was in his twenties and uh, he and B. Griffith had this love affair. B. was a very um, special monk. And, and he was in his seventies, he, he told me he was ready to die. He thought he was packing his bags to tie. And this young scientist shows up from England. And he got so excited about the new science B did that he stayed, decided to live. <laughs> and at the same time, B got excited that, that Christianity had a mystical tradition we, she hadn't heard any of in all the schooling he had back in England, which is typical of Western education for the last 500 years. And so uh, B became, a, a, what should I say, a, a close friend of Rupert also, and a big mentor for him. And Rupert became a mentor to be. It's a Wonderful story. story. Uh, Suzanne Taylor, who is a friend of mine, has a, a series of questions about, I think this is about your book, Original Blessing. She says, first of all, our humanness rests in what you wrote about in Original blessing. And she has two questions. Uh, were you the first to talk about original blessing? And she wonders if that was your original thought. I guess maybe those are the same question. Uh -huh. Yes, as far as I know, I'm the first one to use that term original blessing. And um, it um, didn't go over well with the powers that be. <laughs> uh, two papacies called the book, quote, dangerous and deviant, unquote. Not the present papacy, but those two papacies that preceded. But, but what that taught me was how thoroughly invested patriarchal religion is in original sin. But the point is that Jesus never heard of original sin. No Jew has ever heard of original sin. Elie Weissel says that original sin is not only not in the Bible, it is alien to Jewish thinking. That is a really strong statement because Jesus was a Jew. So Jesus not only never heard of it, but is alien. And yet the Western church has taken original sin and run with it for 1600 years. The first one to use original sin was Augustine in the fourth century, which is the same century that the church took over the empire. 
So I think the lesson is that if you're going to run an empire, original sin is a, is a good idea. Get people in line and they'll join up for the army to fight others in the name of Christ, supposedly. So uh, that's why it's hung around so long. But um, yes, I think I'm the first one to come up with the term original blessing. However, I found after the book came out that Thomas Aquinas, who's a doctor of the church and a saint, uses the term original goodness, and he uses it frequently, original goodness. And that's the same thing as original blessing. Blessing is a theological word for goodness. And then Hildegard of Bingen, who recently was canonized a saint and a doctor of the church, she uses the term original wisdom. And again, I found this after my book came out. And then, in addition, um, Julian of Norwich, a wonderful 15th century, she's sitting over my shoulder here, uh, English uh, mystic, and the first woman to write a book in England, in English. <laughs> um, she talks, too, about how we're, um, joy is our birthright, and uh, uh, God is a goodness in nature. And that nature is God and so forth. So she has this concept, again, without the exact word. So what I'm saying is, yes, I'm the first one to use the, those two words, but the concept is there. And it, check out Genesis 1. Just check out the first page of the Bible. It's, all, it's a cosmology, first of all. It's, it's a story of the unfolding of the universe. And humans come last, just like we do in, in today's scientific creation story. But all along the way, we're told this is good, that the earth is good, and the moon is good, and the sun is good, and all this stuff is good, the plants, the animals. And when humans come up, the whole picture is very good, and that Hebrew word can also be translated very beautiful. That's Genesis 1. So that's original blessing is right there. I swear, 95% of Christian preachers since the 4th century have had the first page of the Bible ripped out by somebody because they jump in with sin which is second and third chapter of the book Bible. They don't begin where the Bible begins. I do, and I got condemned for it, but condemned by a pretty corrupt series of popes. But the point is that, hey, yeah, it's bad psychology, it's bad sociology, and it's bad theology to begin with original, and it's bad science, because if you begin with anthropocentrism, with the human, you're leaving out 13.8 billion years of science and theology, if you will, the unfolding of God's universe, the sacred universe. And so what do you get? You get what we're facing, extinction. You get, you get matricide, the killing of Mother Earth. That's what you get. So um, it's a scandal that... Um, so much of religion has gone down this rabbit hole of original sin just to serve empires. And um, it's bad psychology, bad sociology, it's bad theology, and it's bad science. Uh, here's a question from C. Funk, who said, would you please elaborate on your perspective about evil? According to A Course in Miracles, only love is real, and anything that is not real does not exist. If evil is not love, can it really exist? Well, Thomas Aquinas says that, that sin is misdirected love. And now, but I want to make a distinction between sin and evil. Now, I wrote a major book on evil. In fact, I just happened to have it here. It's a, it's a big book. <laughs> it scares some people, but it's fun to read. But it's Sins of the Spirit, Blessings of the Flesh, Transforming Evil in Soul and Society. And what I do there, first of all, I acknowledge that I think religion is so oversold sin in the West that we don't even have a language for dealing with evil. Sin and evil are not the same thing. Sin is smaller than evil. But I learned the a big insight from a Native American teacher, Buck Ghosthorse, a Lakota teacher who is a friend of mine and who taught with us for years. He said, um, one day he said to me, in our tradition, fear is a door in the heart that allows evil spirits in. Sin is a door in the heart that allows evil spirits in. That was so insightful. Notice the difference between sin and evil. 
that sin opens a door. Now, again, back to Aquinas. He says, sin is misdirected love. Now, this is very Jewish because a Hebrew word for sin is an archery term that means missing the bullseye. So this is why I, my approach in this book on evil is this. I, I go east, and so it's ecumenical. I say the seven chakras are naming the bullseyes in our psychology and physiology and spirituality. That is to say these energy points where love in, comes out and light comes out. What if they were off center? Would, would the seven chakras of the East correspond to the seven capital sins of the West? And that's what I built the book around. And it, it works. It's a new language for talking about sin and evil. And it's ecumenical, which it should be today because we're in this predicament as humans together. We're, we sin in the East and we sin in the West. And we let evil in the East, we let, let evil in in the West. So, so that why don't we explore these various traditions that help us to stand up to, to uh, sin and evil? And um, so now there are two ways to think of, of evil. One is, and that's what the quote you had from the book of, uh, of uh, Miracles has, is privatio boni, the privation of the good, the absence of the good. That's one angle on evil. But the other angle is a force in itself. And I think that this is equally real. Now, Carl Jung had a big fight with Victor um, White, a, an English Dominican, uh, who they were close friends and they were corresponding for years, but then they broke up. They had a divorce over this one subject that Jung felt the privation of good was not enough of a definition for evil. And he, of course, came up with the word shadow, which is a rich word and a rich concept because of that. But they fought over that and they broke up over that. But although on his deathbed, I think he wrote a, a letter of reconciliation to Victor. But my point, I, I'm bringing both into this because I'm saying there is a force. And why do I say that? Because these powers, say, of racism, they keep coming back. They don't die. Evil doesn't die. There's something spiritual about it. It's immortal. So, um, you know, King did his wonderful thing with millions of followers in the 50s and 60s to combat racism. And here we are in 2022, and we've got white supremacy permeating the media, some media, and some social media, and some politicians and some media. So it's back. Of course it's back because it's evil. It's not a thing. You don't wipe out evil as Martin Buber said. You don't, you don't destroy evil. You, you try to convert it to the good because it is an energy. And of course that's what Gandhi did and that's what King did with nonviolence. They converted even Wallace, the governor of Alabama, he got converted toward the end of his life that, hey, maybe segregation wasn't necessary and maybe racism isn't a good thing. So that's what nonviolence can do. It can change people's minds. It can transform. So those are some things I say about evil. But um, uh, take a look at my book. It, uh, it's, it's another approach to evil. And again, I think it's very important to realize that um, we don't even have a vocabulary for it. And I'm, I'm not the only one to say that. Uh, Scott Peck said that. He said that our discussion of, of evil is at a, at, uh, let me say, a, a, a childish stage at this time. We don't have language. Well, that's one reason I wrote this book, to build a language. And I'll give you an example. If we want to go further, evil is an important issue today. Real quick, seven chakra. Seven chakra, when it's healthy, represents the the culmination of the other six chakras and the light and the energy and the fire that comes up our spine. And then it goes out, this light goes out to other light beings, whether it's ancestors or angels or other humans trying to do good things in the world. We link up. That's what community is, common task, common tasking for good causes. Okay, that's healthy. What if some chakra is unhealthy, off center? That's envy. Envy recognizes the good in others. But instead of linking up to do common good together, it shoots it down. 
That's just going on in Ukraine. That's Putin. Putin is envious that there's a young democracy on his border that's doing well, and he wants to wipe it out. That's, that's what envy does. Envy leads to war. It leads to lies. And it, it, you know, it leads to domination. So that's an example. And each, each of the seven chakras and seven capital sins um, are like that. When you look at that in them in that light, it really sheds, I think, a lot of understanding, not only of what, what evil is, but also how to combat it. That you, you combat envy by building up community. Once again, very well put. And we're at the top of the hour, so I want to let our viewers know that we're going to continue for another 30 minutes until, until the bottom of the hour. Here's a question from Andre Slavosh Krasowski. And he's asking, well, I'm going to divide his question into two. He's asking about parapsychology. And he wants to know, what do you think about the Catholic churches or the Vatican's attitude towards parapsychology? Uh, do you think it changes in any way? But first, I think it would be good to hear uh, if you have any thoughts yourself about the field of parapsychology. Well, um, I know that my friend Rupert Sheldrake has worked in that field quite a lot. And um, I do think that actually the Catholic Church is rich with many stories, as um, as uh, rich traditions are, east and west, of um, um, call it extra normal experiences and so forth. But um, my own experience is that uh, there's a lot more extra normal experiences going on than people are, are aware of because we don't ask one another these questions. For example, um, I alluded to the book on angels that I wrote with, with Rupert Sheldrake. And after that book came out, I got a lots of interesting uh, mail and visits from people. Uh, I got a visit from an engineer whose wife was a lawyer, so two very grounded people, who told me that angels had visited them on a regular basis. And they even had taken uh, tape recordings of their conversations. And they came and visited me and played some of these conversations. And um, often when I would lecture, I'd tell, I'd ask the crowd. Um, I remember one, one place, I was lecturing in LA. And uh, I think there were about 200 people there, 250 people. I said, now shut your eyes. I said, because, you know, it's not about competition or showing off or anything. How many of you people have had experiences of angels? About 80% raised their hand. And I said, how many of you have friends whom you trust who are not kooky, who've had experience of angels? And about 75% raised their hand. So, and yet how many have talked about these visitations from angels or experiences with angels? You know, it's not, it's not a usual part of our, of our conversations, is it? We'd rather talk about the weather or sports or something. Um, so that's just one example um that people do have visit and then a friend of mine who's not at all religious he's, he's chinese but he's raised with no particular religion although i see in him elements of taoism and confucianism and even buddhism but he, he's not religious he doesn't go to temple or anything but he he told me the story more than once that after his mother died three months after his mother died she appeared to him at the foot of his bed and they had a conversation and uh, she told him to remember the values I've taught you and so forth. And every time he told me this story, and he's a blue collar worker, um, he works with his hands. And um, every time he's told me the story, you know, tears come to his eyes. It's an absolutely real and important and beautiful and memorable experience of his life. So again, I talk about this in light of the, the theme of resurrection that uh, or reincarnation but i again i'll have people shut their eyes in a, in a big audience and i'll say how many i'll tell this story and say how many of you have had experiences like this there are people you loved came and visited you after they died again 85 to 90 percent and uh and then i was and how many of you have friends who you trust same thing 
So these are just two examples that, um, what can I say? Don't make mainstream conversations, even in church groups. But uh, to me, it makes it much easier to understand the stories of the resurrection of Jesus. You know, there are some left brain exegetes, you know, scripture scholars who say, oh, well, uh, these stories contradict each other. In one story, he's eating food. In another, he doesn't have a body. In another, he's this and that. Well, of, of course, why wouldn't there be that? To me, makes it valid that you don't have one party line. I mean, whenever you get human beings together, you get different experiences. And, you know, the old story of the seven uh, blind men uh, uh, touching the ele- different part of the elephant. You know, they each have a different story to tell because they're each touching the part of the other. Why wouldn't that be true of of things that happen after death, too? So these are just a a few examples of um, areas that I think are important that that I've had. I like I don't say I believe in angels. I say I know they're angels because I've encountered them, too. But I've encountered them with other people, too, who are absolutely reliable, you know, trustworthy normal people and uh just because it doesn't fit a certain box that we call science uh may mean that that box has to break open and in fact it is breaking open today we are undergoing a real uh, reformation if i can borrow a religious term of of science as i say there are more mystics there are so more scientists who are mystics today than bishops and that's a pretty interesting place to be as a as a civilization. And it was, it was um, one great scientist who died young. Um, uh, at the end of his, his important book, and now I'm going to forget his name right now, but anyway, he says that um, what I'm talking about, um, oh, the self-organizing universe uh, is his important book. Janch, Eric Janch, yeah, physicist. He said, and at the end of the book, he says, what I'm talking about is what mystics have been talking about for centuries. But now that I'm talking about as a scientist, people are going to listen. More people are going to listen. And he's right. We're not in a world that listens to theologians. We're in a world that listens more to science. But what he's talking about, the self-organizing universe and uh, interdependence, which is really the basis of compassion, this is science and mysticism coming together because interdependence is that, um, that rule of the universe, that habit of the universe that calls us to compassion. And this is what the Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad and all say, and everyone's called us to. So there's a great um, marriage going on about science and mysticism today. And parapsychology is part of that, but I don't, you know, I don't lead with parapsychology to me that, you know, we should honor the experiences we have. But, and then we start talking about it and say, oh, you had an experience like that too? Well, oh, Jesus had an experience like that too. That's cool. Oh, the shamans have an experience like that? Well, isn't that interesting? It must be part of human nature. It's part of being a homo sapiens that you have these experiences. Now, I have to ask you, Matthew, since you mentioned that you have had personal encounters with angels. Uh, would you be comfortable describing that? Well, I'll give one example. Um, a number of years ago, I was uh, on the East Coast uh, doing some lecturing. And um, I was, um, I landed in Newark from another part of the East Coast, I can't remember where. And um, I was going, and I was going to visit uh, Frank. What's his first name? He was a Zen artist, Frederick Frank. He lived in upstate New York, near Albany or something. Anyway, upstate. And so I landed in Newark, and I rented a car. And it was raining, and it was night or evening, but it was dark, so it must have been winter time or something. But anyway. I was driving this rental car um, off the airport there, and it broke down. And um, uh, so there I was along the side of the road. And of course, this was before cell phones. And um, 
and it was pouring rain and I realized, well, I, I gotta go, go for help. You know, I gotta go someplace. I'm not gonna get any place, sit in the car. So I, I took with me my most valuable bag, which had Hildegard slides in. I was lecturing on Hildegard at that time. These slides are very valuable to me. And I got out of the car. And at that very moment, a real beat up car pulled right up beside me and uh, stopped. And I was, and uh, these big thugs got out of the car. And I just said to myself, well, this is interesting. I'm gonna die in a ditch because there was a ditch there. And in, in, um, in Newark, you know, I wasn't afraid. I just said that to myself, oh, I'm gonna die in a ditch. <laughs> And these big guys were coming toward me. And obviously they were gonna rumble or something. And at that very moment, a police car pulled up. And the policeman said to me, what are you doing? And I said, well, my car died and I, it's a mental car and I'm going for help. He said, get in there and lock all the doors and I'll call for help. And of course, with that, the the guys got back into their car and, and drove away. I, I think that was a visit by angels. You see, angels are taking can take on uh, other um, appearances uh, when when they care to. And I, I think you know, what are the odds of a policeman arriving at a bear exactly that second and saying those words and all the rest? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't have proof that it wasn't a real policeman, but to me it's 99%, it was a, an angel visiting. <clears throat> well, it's a lovely story. And now here's a question from Andan Sass. These are YouTube names, Andan Sass. How should theology be taught to children or the new generation without any religious influence? Well, you know, um, just today I got something in the mail, which um, was uh, a children's book by, uh, a, I guess, a student of mine. Um, it just came in the mail literally today. It's a children's book. And um, it's called uh, Olivia's Question. And her, her question was, um, and this came to her in a dream, I think. Uh, the question was something about where do I come from? Where was I? And what was I before I became me? Yeah, that was the question that came to her, a child's question. Um, I think there are a lot of children's books today that are beginning with, um, the universe, as we should be beginning with, as Thomas Berry says, that the, the, the universe is the primary sacrament. The universe is a primary sacred being in our lives. And so you, if you begin that way, um, things unfold. Um, now, I wrote a children's book years ago called The Beginning There Was Joy. That's right. In the beginning There Was Joy. And um, part the, and I got that from Thomas Aquinas saying that sheer joy is God's and this demands companionship. So that the the beginning of the universe was was generated by joy. We're here to be joyful. We're here to celebrate. And Thomas Berry says the same thing. So um, I think you take some of these new stories of the universe and the um, spiritual commentaries on them, and you begin that way. Again, that's how the Bible begins with Genesis 1, with cosmology. And, and even the, the Bible agrees with science that we were the last. So everything that comes forward is good, it's blessed, it's sacred, and it's necessary. That's something that we can really prove from science today. It was all necessary. The fireball was necessary, and the cooking that went on there, the original uh, hydrogen and nitrogen and so forth, it was all necessary for the galaxies to happen and the planets to happen and for us to happen. So I think that's where you begin. You begin with the creation story. And that is again why creation spirituality is the name of the game today. Not only because we're destroying it, but also because it birthed us. 
and um, uh, and that wipes away all the self consciousness and the self hatred of our species. You know, it's not just that we hate others; it be, hatred begins with self hatred, and um, and religion has been preaching guilt for so long. That's why when people see original blessing, they go, ah, finally, you know, they breathe again. Because, you know, I, I, I had a student who was a psychologist. And after she left our master's program, uh, she told me the story that, you know, she set up her, her psychology shingle again. She said, every time a new client comes in, she gives them original blessing when they leave. They have their first meeting, but at the very end of the first meeting, she gives them original blessing. She says 90% don't come back again. And I said, well, wow, that's not a very good affirmation of my <laughs> writing, is it? No, she said, don't come back because it's my experience and 90% of the problems people bring to me are religious problems based on an ideology of original sin, based on the fall the of redemption um, guilt-ridden, shame-ridden version of, of Christianity. So when they get this thing, it they don't need me anymore, you know, because what they have to do is erase their religious, a lot of their religious teachings and get on with, with the good news. So, um, yeah, so I think that there, there are many ways to teach original blessing and that, especially for children, you know, men and women alike should be um, creating these stories and um, and getting children to paint them and to draw them about the blessings of their life and the story of the how the universe brought us here is all of which has been a, a good thing for us as a species. The next question uh, was going to take us back to the abortion issue. It's from Thurso Berwick, who says, how can one support ethical veganism and also abortion? Well, um, I've written about my position on um, Abortion. Uh, there's a, a magazine, actually, it's a, called Conscience, which is a nice name for a magazine. And it's, um, it's actually a, a Catholics who put it out. It's interesting that two thirds of Catholics in America are in favor of Roe and, and Wade, Roe versus Wade. It's called Conscience. And I published the article here called Moving Beyond the Abortion Fixation, some theological context. So I lay it out in more detail, the issues that I see uh, raised by abortion. Now, I'll just put my position out there. In principle, now this is careful language. In principle, I am against abortion because I think we should be conservative about the, the mystery of life. Uh, at the same time though, I'm not against people who have abortions. And I am even more against, let me say this in capital letters, I am more against men telling women what they can and cannot do with their bodies, especially when they're creepy judges and creepy politicians. And I have three sisters as well as three brothers. And um, I don't want these creepy men telling my sisters what they can and cannot do with their bodies, I think. My sisters, like their peers, are perfectly capable of making intelligent, moral decisions. Now, I've never met a woman who had an abortion who, did, who found it an easy decision. And that's the point. It's a very complex decision. And Roe versus Wade does not tell anyone to get an abortion. Let me say it again. It doesn't tell anyone they have to get an abortion. What it is saying is this, if we have abortion and we do have abortion and we will always have abortion and we have always had abortion. If we have abortion, it should be as safe as possible for the mother. And in the Jewish tradition, and this is where there are differences you see. In the Jewish tradition, a fetus is not considered a human being until it leaves the mother. Now, 
even in Catholicism or in Christianity, there have been debates for centuries about when the fetus becomes human. Aquinas did not think the fetus was human from the beginning. In fact, he says first it's plant, then it's animal, and then it gets a human soul. And for him, that was roughly six weeks or seven weeks. But again, he didn't have science on his side. That was his guess. But the point is that even he saw an evolution in these religious fanatics today think they know exactly when a fetus becomes a human being. But humans have never known that. It's a big question. So the Jewish tradition, which is Jesus' tradition, um, has their answer to that. And they say when there is a choice between the fetus and the mother's survival, the mother should always get precedence because the mother already has responsibilities and relationships and so forth. And so we have to look at the diversity of opinions. And the Muslims have their opinions and they're diverse within themselves, but they're not, no religion has just one opinion on exactly what the answer is. It's much more complicated than that. And of course, today with uh, women who are very poor and so forth um, and very exhausted perhaps because they are already mothers in poor circumstances, that needs to be taken into consideration as well. So um, then there's a principle in moral philosophy about the lesser of two evils. And that's really what I'm saying, that abortion is a lesser evil than men taking upon themselves to quote 17th century witch burnings, witch burners, and tell all the women in America what they can do with their bodies. I don't trust Judge Alito or Clarence Thomas or Kavanaugh or Amy Barrett or Gorsuch to have that wisdom. And I don't want their, their hands on women's bodies. I trust women to get the counsel, both from their doctors and from their minister or rabbi or priest or whatever their or, uh, iman or, or whatever their tradition is or know a tradition to make up their conscience and um, to follow their conscience in this. So that's where I am. You can be both for vegan and for allowing abortion to be as undestructive um, as possible toward women. And there's just no doubt. I mean, all the facts are coming out. But what's going to happen if this Roe versus Wade is overturned? What is going to mean forcing women to have babies from rapists and from incest, from close relatives? And all this, this is not being allowed for in most of these states that are so gung-ho on, um, on controlling women. And let us not forget that the control of women always goes with fascism, because fascism is itself a philosophy of control, or as Susan Sodtog defines it, institutional violence, institutional violence. The Supreme Court telling women what they can and cannot do with their bodies is institutional violence in neon lights. It's part of fascism. Fascism is about controlling others, and especially about men controlling women. And I thought we, we were putting this behind us. I thought we're moving beyond patriarchy and trusting that women are perfectly capable of developing their consciences. And I've, you know, I've spoken to women who've had abortions and I've done rituals with women who've had abortions because you know, there is a, for some, there is definitely a, a relationship there uh, that they want to acknowledge with the fetus. And it's, well, that's what churches should be doing instead of linking up with creepy judges and creepy politicians telling 50% of the human race that these people have the rights over women's bodies. Are you kidding me? Instead of doing that, they should be uh, uh, creating rituals for healing, 
But also this, if you're against abortion, fine. You don't have to get one. Roe versus Wade isn't telling you to get one. And you're perfectly free to convince other women and fathers not to get abortion. You could convince people not to. But it doesn't mean you have the right to, to tell everybody what their decisions should be. And especially when it's driven by religion, a particular religion, which it is, of course, given these five very far right wing Catholics that were appointed to the Supreme Court for that very purpose, to kill Roe versus Wade. So you can be a good Catholic. Two thirds of American Catholics believe that Roe versus Wade should survive for the, I think, for the very reasons that I lay out. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, well, I can stop there. Oh, okay, and the, the other half of that question uh, was about veganism. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, um, I, I think I alluded to how um, veganism can stop climate change. D did I talk about that at this? Because I is... actually don't recall that you oh, did. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on this. It's exciting. I was in a conference at Sierra, sponsored by Sierra Club. Um, just before the COVID, it was two and a half years ago. And there were, I was asked to speak. I was asked to speak on the Pope's encyclical at RTC on environment, which is a very good uh, piece of work. One scientist told me it was far and away the finest uh, work on science that's ever come out of the Vatican. And um, that's Pope Francis's encyclical, which, by the way, was written by a former student of mine. And 80% um, of it was. And then um, there were two scientists who spoke about ecology. That was the theme. And um, one of the scientists uh, spoke about veganism. And he, he said, now, by the way, he was um, originally, he's from India, but he worked in Silicon Valley. And I think he invented Intel or something to do with the foundation of Intel. But he quit Intel to work 100% now on ecology, saving the earth. And um, he's written... Uh, three books, and his name is Selesh Rao, R-A-O, Carbon Dharma and Carbon Yoga, The Vegan Metamorphosis. And I highly recommend his work, but he got up and had slides, and he said, now listen to me, I'm an engineer, I know my numbers, and I've done my numbers. Here's the deal. If every human became vegan, we would, in 10 years, we would end climate change and begin to reverse it, provided that we turn all the land we have turned over to livestock today into trees, which was what it was originally. So turn the, the land that is livestock land today into trees, go vegan, and we would have an end to climate change and, and even a reversal after 10 years. Now, I was very taken by this. Then recently I was at a memorial service for my brother-in-law, and I met a 17-year-old grandnephew of mine who lives in Germany. He, my niece married a German woman, so a uh, man, a German man, and um, so he's 17 years, and he's vegan, pure vegan, heavy vegan. He turned at 14 years of age. Like, he won't even sit on a leather chair or wear um, wool clothes and so forth, and um, his father's had a hustle to learn how to cook vegan and all that because he's not that good a cook himself, this young man. But it was really interesting talking to him. And a lot of people of his generation are beginning to get it. That when you're young, you know, you're in, your body is more willing to, to choose a path. Uh, we who are older, I think, are more stuck and we have enough trouble with our bodies without radical changes. But my point is this. I don't think we're going to get 100% vegan, but there's a spectrum. I think we should be preaching veganism for the very reason I've given. But then there's also vegetarianism, which is another part of the spectrum. And then there's also less meat and less fish, which everyone can contribute to. Myself, I gave up beef about 26 years ago after I read the book on diet for, for America. So I know you can give up uh, beef because I've done it. But the point is that we all have to become more aware. And, you know, when I see scientists saying this is what's going to cure um, climate change, this is going to cure climate change, I'm all for their developing better batteries and, and more 
you know, sustainable energy and all that good, clean stuff. And now they just started this machine in Iceland that's going to suck in carbon dioxide. Terrific. Do it all over. Great ideas. But let's not leave out these other options that um, that uh, we humans do have choices about our diet. And they should not be dictated to us by industries and corporations and um, uh, you know, that, that don't have the imagination because they're so in bed with uh, greed and capitalism, don't have that ma- imaginations or the conscience to ask, maybe raising all this beef isn't good for the planet or tearing down rainforest to raise cattle may not be good for the planet, which they're still doing in Brazil. So um, I think it's a very important question. And I think it's become a public question. It's become a political question, be part of our politics, you know, how, and get the facts out there. Like the 17 year old, he had his facts about what veganism can do uh, for the world and how it can change our psyches as well to get entirely out of the, the, the mood <laughs> that we have rights over other animals, that they're all here to serve us and be our, 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 our dinner. Um, you know, there's a lot of profound uh, wisdom in questioning some of that. And uh, so I think, again, a spectrum. I'm not an ideologue on this, and I don't, I try not to practice what I, what I, pre- I try to practice what I preach. And um, I'm not becoming vegan at 81, but I admire my 17 year old grandnephew who is. And, and I, I try to analyze and say, well, there's something to be learned from this. There really is. And, and the bottom line is that, right, we're not here to, to extract Mother Earth or to extract all of her creatures. We are here to link up with them. If some of them are our dinner, well, let's at least say thank you and let's not overeat. Words of wisdom. Well, Matthew, our scheduled time is up. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being with me and with the New Thinking Aloud audience. I'm also pleased to let people know that we are planning several more discussions on the New Thinking Aloud series, particularly about the great mystics of of the past. Uh, And I'd like to Uh, let people know that they can subscribe to our weekly newsletter if they would like to by going to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, which is newthinkingaloud, all one word, dot O-R-G. And before we sign off, uh, can you tell people your website? How can they reach your organization? Right. Well, matthewfox.org, two T's, is my website. And then Daily Meditations with Matthew Fox, um, one word, dot org is the daily meditations and it's free and you can uh, sign up, register there and uh, join the rest of us. So I want to thank you, Jeffrey, for this opportunity and the wonderful questions that came in. You have a very intelligent audience and, uh, and your questions too, of course, and your guidance in this. So thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great pleasure and I look forward to our next conversation. And now 